paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. From the ancient world to the modern, history tells the story of our ever-growing need to be ever-growing. The story of how some people will go to extraordinary lengths to expand, create, to advance, to push the realm of possibility, to prove that size matters. This series will explore larger-than-life creations that have influenced every facet of our society. The way we live, work, and travel. The way we build empires. And the way we dream. We look back at the ways we've strived to make the biggest, heaviest, tallest, the best. We hear from experts about the technology that made these feats possible, the challenges that were faced, and the problems that were solved. Some of these inventions have changed the world and our way of life. Others, not so much. Whether a success or a failure, these giants have demonstrated mankind's need to build big. In this episode, we explore the tallest towers, the biggest palaces, the grandest tombs, and ancient temple complexes that were forgotten for centuries. Having a house that's taller than other people's houses, having a church that's taller than other people's church, has always been something that people have wanted to do. We look at the best, the biggest, the most modern, and journey back to see how technique, technology, and ambition has grown these structures from big to bigger to biggest. We start the journey with the buildings that dominate the skylines of today. Skyscrapers. With modern design and technology, a single building can accommodate thousands of people, living and working. But in a modern city, there simply isn't the space to spread out. We kind of have two choices. We have a build out or we build up. It's much, much more sustainable to build up, create dense, compact cities where people have access to public transportation than it is to build out. And what building has gone further up or solved as many of the problems of building tall than the Burj Khalifa? When it was completed, this was the tallest skyscraper in the world. It's not just the tallest building in the world, it's actually nearly 200 metres or so taller than the second tallest building. I was lucky enough to visit the Burj Khalifa site during its construction in 2008, and, and really it's an engineering marvel. Construction took 22 million man-hours and involved some quite staggering statistics. Over 45,000 cubic meters of concrete was poured. And when you're at those very, very high heights, the wind is creating an enormous amount of force. The Burj Khalifa is never going to be pushed over, right? Because it is so wide down at the base, and it's got a much wider area to spread the load of the building itself on. 
What it adds up to is a building that boasts the highest number of stories in the world. At 160, the highest observation deck in the world and the highest occupied floor in the world. And the innovation that goes into something like that is pretty awe-inspiring. Burj Khalifa is a showcase of cutting-edge architecture and engineering, a testament to ambition and a powerful statement on how far skyscrapers have come since they first transformed a city skyline. But it is here in New York we find what was for many years the tallest and what remains the most iconic skyscraper in the world. The idea for the Empire State Building is said to have arisen through a rivalry between Walter Chrysler of the Chrysler Corporation and John Jacob Rascom of General Motors. We take you now to the Chrysler Building in New York City to the office of the President of the... Chrysler had already begun work on the Chrysler Building, the gleaming 319-meter skyscraper in Midtown Manhattan. In retaliation, Rascob assembled a group of well-known investors. There was a story that the developer held out a pencil and said, make it as tall as possible like this. The building was constructed in just over a year, under budget at $40 million, and well ahead of schedule. At times, the structure grew four and a half stories a week. That is much faster than we build skyscrapers today. There are many reasons why they were able to achieve this. It was the Great Depression, there was a lot of labor available, so 4,000 workers were on site at certain times. The way that they walked on beams and they sat on beams to have their lunch would not happen today. At the time of its completion, the Empire State Building, at 102 storeys and 381 metres high, was the world's tallest skyscraper. The Empire State Building still... This iconic building has enjoyed an eventful history. The pilot of a Mitchell bomber circling over LaGuardia airfield decided to divert to Newark because of fog. His course took him straight into the Empire State Building. The plane crashed into the 78th and 79th floors at about 200 miles an hour. Blazing petrol set fire to 11 floors of the building. I just thought this was the most fabulous, fabulous creation, that you could create what is, in effect, a spire of modern capitalism. The Empire State Building will always be an icon synonymous with New York. Although losing its title as the world's tallest building, to that city's World Trade Center in 1972. The twin towers of Manhattan's World Trade Center stood at 110 stories each, accommodating 50,000 workers in 10 million square feet of space. The original Twin Towers were really innovative buildings of the time. They were one of the first buildings to use a new structural system called a framed tube system. Two large hollow tubes supported by closely spaced steel columns encased in aluminium. The skin of the building would be strong enough that internal columns wouldn't be necessary to support it. The towers were designed to be strong enough to withstand a collision with the largest aircraft flying at the time. It was assumed such a plane would have to be lost in fog for such a thing to occur. What brought down the World Trade Center was not the impact, it was the fire after, it was the heat from that. As the floors destroyed by the impact began to collapse, they delivered a load onto the lower structures, which broke the clips linking the floor joists to the outer box columns. Wow. 
Now, a new addition to the New York skyline, Freedom Tower, soars to 541 meters and is the Western Hemisphere's tallest building, already an iconic New York landmark. Its very height is 1,776 feet tall, you know, the date to the American independence. In a way, this proud statement is a good statement. You can do that to us as a country, but you don't stop us as a nation. That's the statement it makes. In the West, where it holds the record, a tall building like Freedom Tower demands respect and attention. In the East, such a big structure symbolizes anticipation of things to come, of climbing in order to see further. And from 101 stories above the city of Taipei, it is possible to see a very long way. The 580 meter tall Taipei 101 has 101 floors and 61 elevators and was, until the opening of the Burj, the world's tallest building. But Taipei 101 is symbolic of something more, something rather special. What separates the design of Taipei 101 from its peers is the deep meaning behind its structure. It's designed to culturally respond to its surroundings. It rises in eight canted sections, a design based on the Chinese lucky number eight. And the eight sections of the structure are designed to create rhythm in symmetry. And the form is a kind of exaggerated pagoda. So a pagoda is a, an Asian piece of architecture that, that fans out as it gets taller. The tower is built on 380 concrete piles, buried 80 meters into the ground. Massive steel outrigger trusses span between the columns on every eight floors. It was one of the first towers to use what was called a tuned mass damper to resist the wind load. This is an 800 ton pendulum over four stories in the top of the tower in an atrium. And if you're lucky or unlucky enough to go up there in a storm, you can stand around this atrium and see this giant pendulum swinging. Taipei 101 is a dynamic piece of architecture, a symbolic design that brings together modern day engineering and architecture and Chinese tradition to make Taipei's Tower 101 unique. You can see the brand actually in the title, Taipei. It's saying, look at this city, look at our innovation. But if Taipei 101 is supersized, then what are we to call Shanghai Tower? Designed as nine cylindrical buildings stacked on top of each other, Shanghai Tower's inner layer of skin encloses the stacked buildings, while a triangular exterior layer creates the second skin, which rotates as it rises. So this is one of the few buildings where you can actually see through a building and see another building inside it. It's really innovative because it's the first tall building that really captures the idea of vertical villages. While it may look like it's 121 storeys, essentially it is nine 12-storey buildings stacked on top of each other, each with their own ground floor. The whole idea of this is to humanise the tall building experience, to break it down into more manageable chunks. The tower aims to be one of the most sustainable tall buildings in the world. The facade's taper, texture and asymmetry all work to reduce wind pressure on the building. Which saved about $60 million in terms of construction and also thousands of tonnes of materials, less concrete, less steel. 
the result is a more sustainable and efficient building. The building's spiralling parapet collects rainwater, which is then used for the tower's heating and air conditioning. Wind turbines located directly beneath the parapet generate on-site power. Shanghai Tower is revolutionary in architecture and sustainability. It's only a matter of time until the skyline is pierced by even bigger giants. But buildings whose size is simply awe-inspiring have been constructed for many centuries to accommodate people of importance. We ended the skyscraper story in China. And that is where we start the story of immense palaces. A palace is designed for display and show to be a canvas as a base for um, you know, arts and culture as well as a symbol of royal authority. In ancient China, it was forbidden to enter the emperor's palace without special permission of the emperor. And so it has become known as the Forbidden City, the world's largest palace complex. The supersized Forbidden City covers 74 hectares. That's about 105 football pitches. It is surrounded by a 52 meter wide moat and a 10 meter high wall. Forbidden City has more than 8,000 rooms. All the buildings are constructed in small clusters of three and six, following the idea of connection with heaven and earth. Construction of the Forbidden City began in 1407 and continued for 14 years. The Forbidden City is said to have occupied a million workers including 100,000 artisans, driven into long-term hard labor. Water, drawn from wells, was poured onto the road in winter to set as ice, along which the huge stones were dragged to the city. The Red City Wall has an angular shape, 8.6 meter wide at the base, reducing to 6.6 .6 meters wide at the top. The design prevents people from climbing over it. The Forbidden City is an example of building without compromise or consideration of cost. From an architectural standpoint, it is amazing treasure. Many monumental structures are a great deal more modest than the Forbidden City. Such modesty is even true of the oldest and largest inhabited castle in the world today. Windsor Castle is an official residence of the Queen and is still very much a working royal palace. William I chose to build Windsor as part of a string of fortifications around London in the 1070s. So Windsor is sited with a commanding view over the Thames Valley. And 16 years later, his castle was complete. Subsequent monarchs have added and modified. Windsor Castle, seen in this fine aerial view, is being renovated and the alterations are not quite complete. There are 951 rooms in the castle. More than 200 of them are bedrooms. So, spring cleaning could be compared to taking the paintbrush to about 105 three-bedroomed houses. It's quite striking that a structure that started as a fortress and Hanand has evolved over so much time can still be considered to be a more intimate space, like a home as well. The largest room 
St. George's Hall, is more than 55 metres long and can seat 162 for a banquet. The Great Kitchen is the oldest working kitchen in the country. 33 people work there, surrounded by clocks that are always set five minutes fast to make sure that the Queen never has to wait for her food. It's really become strongly associated as a symbol of royal authority as opposed to government per se. Since it was first built, the role of Britain's monarch has changed most dramatically. Power has long since shifted away from Windsor to another palace further along the Thames. A palace not occupied by a monarch, but a supersized, super decorative, super famous complex of buildings occupied by British Parliament. The buildings on this site are known as the Palace of Westminster. The Palace of Westminster has a long and varied history. It was originally built as a palace in the middle of the 11th century by uh, Edward the Confessor. There's over 1,100 rooms, 100 staircases, several miles of corridors, and it covers around about eight acres. Sitting on over three hectares, the complex has three towers. The tallest, the Victoria Tower, peaks at just under 100 metres. The next is 96 metres tall, and the most famous, it is the Elizabeth Tower, known around the world as Big Ben. The hour hand is over two and a half metres long, the minute hand more than four metres, and the diameter seven metres. Big Ben, to be correct, is the hour bell, and they used 16 horses to bring it to Westminster in 1859. Westminster is one of the most iconic structures on the skyline of London. But the Palace of Westminster has come to represent more than the government of Great Britain. A palace built with a parliamentary purpose, its name describes a system of government. Just across the English Channel is another palace that has come to represent its age and the people who built it. It stands for the blind extravagance of a complacent elite. This palace was built to be beautiful, boastful, and very, very big. The Chateau de Versailles is an achievement of 18th century French art. The site, originally Louis XIII's hunting lodge, was transformed and expanded by his son, Louis XIV. Each of the three French kings who lived there added improvements in an effort to make it more beautiful. The facts and figures that tell the story of this folly are truly dazzling. The gardens sprawl over more than 12,000 hectares and include more than 400 statues and 1,400 fountains. Huge figures, but the palace is big enough to swallow them all. The palace has 700 rooms. It also has 67 staircases. As well as four chapels, an opera house, and the famed Hall of Mirrors that in the days of the kings was illuminated by 20,000 candles when the sun was not shining through any of the palace's 2,153 windows. It is very monumental. So this building was built to impress. Versailles kings and courtiers are long gone. The gardens and corridors now walked by over 7 million visitors a year. Across the Pyrenees, 
An even grander palace was built to proclaim the might of what had been. In its day, a far grander empire that could quite literally lavish on its kings and queens the wealth of the Americas. The Royal Palace in Madrid stopped being the official residence of the King of Spain in 1931. Since then, the Palacio Real has been the venue for state ceremonies, official banquets and other state functions. Well, the feature that strikes a visitor as soon as you go there is the sheer imposing size and monumental scale of the palace. The palace's origins can be traced to the 9th century, when the Muslim king of Toledo built a defence which was later used by the Christian kings of Castile. They built the former Alcazar in the 16th century. And the current royal palace was built big. Inside the palace, there's a monumental and imposing staircase um, reportedly carved out of one single piece of marble. For size, 700 rooms seem insignificant. The Palacio Real has 3,418 rooms, arranged on 135,000 square metres. There are 252 bedrooms. There is Spanish marble, mahogany, and works of art inside a palace which occupies 13 hectares, the largest and considered to be one of the finest palaces in Europe. It's a remarkable expression of Golden Age Spain. Royal palaces from Beijing to Madrid were built to house and flatter earthly rulers. Around the world, there are monuments that dwarf even these big palaces. And they were built not to house men, but to praise that which was not of this earth. When the ancestors of those who built the Palacio Real were still living in huts on the other side of the world, in the largest urban concentration on the planet, a structure was being built that is so stupendous, it staggers visitors to this day. Cambodia's Angkor Wat, built by Suryavaman II, is the earthly representation of Mount Meru, abode of Hindu gods dedicated to the Lord Vishnu. It is the largest religious structure in the world. It is dazzling. It is so difficult to convey. How big? That is still being determined. The very latest aerial laser mapping continues to locate parts of the complex that have been overgrown by a rampant jungle. Well, Angkor's pretty remarkable. Everybody knows it as a bunch of big temples. But that's like knowing New York as Manhattan. New York stretches a very long way in many directions. Current measurements come to 162.6 hectares. And it was constructed from sandstone, five million tons of sandstone. The initial construction of Angkor Wat involved 300,000 workers and 6,000 elephants and they worked for 35 years. It's built out of rough blocks, and then it's surrounded by a scaffolding, and then it's chiseled from the top down to do the decoration. Inside the central temple complex is the gallery of a thousand Buddhas. To get to the upper level involves climbing incredibly steep stairs because reaching the kingdom of the gods is not supposed to be an easy task. Angkor Wat is a temple that is still used every day.
But there are other holy sites that are just only being rediscovered after almost being consumed by the jungle. To visit one, we must travel across the world to Central America. It took archaeologists from the University of Pennsylvania 13 years to uncover the 16 square kilometers of structures that comprise Tikal, Guatemala's most famous cultural site. I think it's very clear people wanted to build something that they thought was going to last perhaps forever. They wanted to put up something so big that even if it fell down, it would still be some enormous thing there. But much of Tikal has yet to be unearthed. Covered by jungle and remaining an unknown mystery for centuries, Tikal was abruptly abandoned by the Mayans over 1,000 years ago. Dating back to 300 BC, at its height, the population of Tikal may have reached more than 90,000 and dominated some 200 square kilometers of surrounding territory. Its grandeur is, even today, hard to comprehend. Tikal is made up of over 3,000 structures, from courts to markets to reservoirs. The largest of these structures are the three giant pyramid temples, ranging from 41 to 70 meters high. The most famous of these is the Temple of the Great Jaguar, used as the tomb of Jasau Chan Kawil I, who ruled from 682 to 734 AD. Building colossal things is our fascination with trying to conquer our mortality and the fact that we want to show that we are much more than what thin present shows and demonstrates. A world away, another civilization was building monumentally. Here were people who built on an epic scale in praise of both their gods and their kings. This was the work of the civilization that flourished on the banks of the River Nile. Today we call it Luxor. A thousand years before Christ, it was the great city of Thebes, the heart of the empire of Egypt. The jewel of its greatness was Karnak, the largest temple in the land. There's no doubt at all that Karnak would have been the biggest temple complex in Egypt, and it probably was the biggest temple complex in the world. Karnak can be divided into numerous sections, with the largest being the temple to the god Amun-Ra. 30 pharaohs contributed to building the complex, using sandstone quarried 160 kilometers away and shipped down the Nile. One obelisk alone weighs 328 tons and is 29 meters tall. A Boeing 747 weighs just over 180 tons and its tail height is under 20 meters. The Great Hippostyle Hall, covering 5,000 square meters, about the size of a football field, had a roof supported by 134 columns up to 10 meters in circumference. And so the blocks were just placed on top of one another. And what we think they did was put the lower courses in place first, then fill the space with rubble and so forth, so you had a level um, area, and then with ramps drag up the next lots of columns, so that they, they, they gradually constructed the actual structure. This grand and ancient temple may have been beaten down by the years, the weather and the predation of tomb robbers. But its scale, its ambition, and its craftsmanship is as spellbinding as when it was freshly built.
there are other sacred sites that carry the scars of turbulent times. One is at the center of a troubled region, the last and venerated remains of a once mighty temple that was the most holy place for its people. This is Hakotel Hammurabi, the Wailing or Western Wall. The second temple, the heart of Judaism, was destroyed by Rome in the year 70. It had been one of the greatest, grandest buildings of the age. And the story of its construction by King Herod is almost legendary. Nothing of that building remains today, but Herod also built a great plaza around the temple. Temple Mount is that plaza. To construct it, Herod built a box on top of Mount Moriah and filled it in, expanding the available land with an area approximately 480 by 300 meters. Retaining walls formed the box and the Kotel, or Western Wall, that is so revered today as the holiest site in modern Judaism is one part of the Western Retaining Wall. It's a place where presence is signaled by absence. So people go there in order to place their prayers in the crevasses in the walls. The wall is five meters thick and built from stones that weigh between two and 100 tons. One weighs 400 tons. There is no mortar between the stones, and the precision with which such stones were placed 2,000 years ago is simply mystifying. It's still very, very, very holy. There is little of the second temple left, but there is something. In Moscow, there is a great cathedral built in recent times with modern tools. Because nothing remains of the original Christ the Savior, blown to pieces by Stalin in 1931. Originally commissioned after the defeat of Napoleon in 1812, the enormous cathedral was eventually consecrated in 1883. But in 1931, the cathedral was destroyed to make way for a proposed palace of the Soviets. Itself a contender for the title of one of the most influential pieces of architecture never built, the design would have stood over 400 meters high, with a vast statue of Lenin at its peak. The Eiffel Tower is only 300 meters high. In 1941, Russia is attacked by Nazi Germany. It's a fight for life. Only the foundations had been laid when the Second World War brought an end to the project. But the story of the cathedral was not over. Following the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Moscow mayor joined forces with the Orthodox Church to resurrect the cathedral in a $340 million reconstruction project. Orthodox cathedrals are built on either a square or an octagonal model, and they have domes rather than spires. And this is because rather than representing the body of Jesus on the cross, they represent, they're a model of the universe. Completed in 2000, the new cathedral loosely based on the original designs but constructed with modern building materials and at 103 meters, the tallest Orthodox church in the world, commemorates Russia's imperial heritage, as opposed to its Soviet past. It's the most important of the Orthodox cathedrals in Russia. But what if? Instead of worship, you want to remember. Around the world, colossal structures have been built to house and honor 
the dead. But we begin this chapter of the story of very big buildings with kings who have been dead for a very, very long time. We return to Egypt. Khufu, second ruler of fourth dynasty Egypt, had the Great Pyramid. The Pyramid of Giza really is absolutely massive. Its, its volume has been calculated as being two and a half million cubic meters of stone. It is the oldest and last remaining of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and the one man-made object that can be discerned from space. Khufu's builders oriented his pyramid almost perfectly north. They incorporated into its structure about 2.3 million stone blocks, weighing an average of 2.5 tons each, and a total of five and three quarter million tons. The Empire State Building, by comparison, only weighs 365,000 tons. To achieve the pyramid's size of 230 meters long and 139 meters high, the workers would have had to set a block every two and a half minutes. What they probably did was get silt from the Nile and pave a sort of a road using silt. And then when you wet that, it's almost like grease. It's incredibly slippery. And so you can, you can drag something across the surface easily. The pyramid has three burial chambers. The king's chamber held a red granite sarcophagus placed almost exactly at the center of the pyramid and is accessed through the eight meter high grand gallery. I knew what they looked like. I thought I knew how big they were. And then you walk up to them and the blocks are taller than you are. It's, it's just staggering. The Great Pyramid has stood for ages, and for ages, it has puzzled and beguiled. Another impressive tomb, but one with a far less mysterious purpose, takes us to the last resting place of a man who was, in his day, the greatest figure in Europe. This is the Dome des Invalides in Paris. People visit it to stand before the sarcophagus of one of the great figures of history. This is the tomb of Emperor Napoleon I, Napoleon Bonaparte. Built between 1670 and 1706, as a royal chapel. The landmark known as Les Invalides was designed to glorify Louis XIV and his armies. It's a series of several buildings connected to each other. There are about 17 courtyards across the complex itself, but it's centered by the Église du Dôme. Louis, for the brilliance of his court, was known as the Sun King and the golden dome of Les Invalides was created to shine as a tribute to him. It shines with more than 12 and a half kilograms of gold leaf. Louis XIV had the courtyards built so that he could parade around the entire army inside the courtyards of the complex. So it was not only a place of rest, it was a place of spectacle. It was not until April 1861 that Napoleon was finally laid to rest under what is known as the Church of St. Louisa. In a tomb sculpted from blocks of red quartzite and placed on a green Vosges granite base, placed in the center of a polychrome marble floor, inlaid with the names of eight great victories. Looked down on by a painted dome that rises 107 meters above the sarcophagus, taller than a 20-story building. 
It's very, very grand. I think it really does meet the kind of remit of the kind of monumental structure. A similarly monumental but much plainer mausoleum contains the mortal remains of another of modern history's great figures. But there is a singular difference between Leon Villard's and the mausoleum in Red Square. In Moscow, you can still view the body of a figure from the pages of history. Lenin, venerated as the Vladimir of the Lenin, father of the Bolshevik Revolution and first leader of Soviet Russia, died in 1924. But each day, a steady line of visitors files past his perfectly preserved remains. A year after Lenin's death, with a pyramid with layers of red, gray, and black granite, the tomb was unveiled. It is intended to be very durable, so it uses the most expensive selection of stone. Russians, in their tens of thousands, have habitually paid tribute to Lenin in Moscow's Red Square. The most important features of the buildings are that it is, in a way, inspired from Egyptian pyramids. While the mausoleum is comparatively small from the outside, it has hidden depths. There are two underground floors to the structure, which used to house a rest area for VIPs and the Kremlin guards, and the laboratory that was used to supervise the ongoing embalming process of Lenin's body. In Lenin's tomb, it is a constant 16 degrees Celsius, with 80 to 90% humidity, but it is still a constant battle against mold and discoloration. In terms of form, it is quite interesting because that building is following avant-garde that was present at that time in Russia and it was a really leading kind of thinking in architecture at the time. The remains interred in the next tomb have not been preserved. The medieval city of Assisi was the birthplace and is the last resting place of St. Francis. Seen from a distance, the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi seems to dominate the landscape. But from the front, its truly massive scale can be hard to discern. In reality, the building dives deep into the mountain, as well as extending far out along the ridge line. It is a gigantic building, 80 meters long, 50 wide, and with the nave 18 meters wide. Construction began on July 17, 1228. The whole complex consists of two major buildings. The lower one is intended to be a crypt. St. Francis's tomb lies in a simple sarcophagus where it rests on bare rock and the upper church is built out of whitewashed stone and fully decorated. There is a famous rose window and it's called to be um, an eye of the most beautiful church in the world. But what really makes the Basilica of St. Francis of Assisi supersized? is the monumental nature of a building erected to house the remains of one man. It is the greatest example of such a function in all of Europe, but not in the world. There is one other marvel of architecture, built as a tomb for a single person, that is surely one of the most widely recognized structures in the world. The Taj Mahal has been called the ultimate expression of love. It 
It's the tomb of Mumtaz Mahal, who was the wife of one of the Mughal rulers of India. She died giving birth to their 14th child. The construction of the Taj Mahal began around 1631. The principal mausoleum was completed in 1648. Parts of the marble buildings have been stained or painted in contrasting colors, creating intricate geometric patterns. The Taj Mahal, now over 300 years old, is in frequent need of repair. For centuries, the work has been passed down from father to son. The implements too, by the look of it. It is estimated that more than 22,000 people worked on the construction. They toiled for 17 years to build the Taj. The Taj Mahal is a remarkably beautiful building and it's deservedly famous throughout the world. The dome of the Taj Mahal is 35 meters tall. The overall height is 71 meters. Seven types of marble brought not just from India, but from China, Tibet, and Afghanistan. Along with 28 types of precious and semi-precious stones were used in the construction. The four perfectly matched sides of the Taj are richly inscribed with carved calligraphy, including the 99 names of Allah. The building is beautiful on a silhouette as part of a panorama, but also up close, the decoration and detail that's gone into every part of that. When the visitor stands and absorbs the wonder of Shah Jahan's expression of love, it is not the size that impresses, it's the beauty. As we have seen, the biggest buildings can be strikingly beautiful. And they have to be structurally brilliant. I think it still remains with us as a contemporary society to really be in awe of a lot of these structures because of not only how they were made, but really how they've lasted throughout centuries. They are each testimony to the dedication and ambition of those who dreamed of, those who designed, and those who built these massive examples of human creativity.